We open our Bibles again, you guessed it, to Ephesians 5. To Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, there is still a couple more insights, lessons that we want to get from this chapter. Um, we have entitled the message today, or the subtitle, The Walk Evidence. We continue in the series, The Spirit Fit Life, Holiness Ambition. The subtitle for the message is The Walk Evidence. We have a new feature in our outlines, and the new feature is a children's outline. So I'm going to call children ages 8 and above attention to your outline, which is found there in your bulletin. And you can also see there the title, The Spirit Filled Life, Holiness Ambition, The Walk Evidence. And it's going to be important, kids, for you to ask your parents at home to help you with the meaning of some difficult words. So there's some difficult words that, that we use and that you can begin to get acquainted with, to know, such as, for example, ambition. What is the meaning of ambition, Dad? And how did the pastor use it in the context of holiness, ambition? What does that mean? There's another word such as evidence that could also be a little difficult for our children. It is our desire as a church that parents will engage more and more in the discipling of their children. And it happens at home throughout the week. It continues on every day. And it gets reinforced in church. But the church cannot do this work for you unless you are engaged, unless you are raising and discipling your kids. Your kids and their faith will suffer tremendously. There are many things in life that we don't take at face value, right? Do you take everything at face value? when it is presented to you? I hope not. Because there are many things in life that demand further evidence than just a surface claim for our acceptance of them, right? Let me tell you, explain more what I'm talking about. For example, things such as love. Be careful if somebody says to you, I love you, right? If somebody says to you, I love you, there should be a demonstration of that love. Don't take it at face value. Especially in this day and age, teenagers say one to another, oh, I love you. I'm so madly in love with you. All right, show me, not the money, show me the love, right? (laughs) Show me the love. That's one of the things that we don't take at face value. For example, also, when we talk about competence, Somebody's going to do a job, and you want to know that a person is competent. You just don't take at face value that somebody says, I'm a good plumber, or I am a good doctor. Usually, we, want, we go behind the claim, the surface claim, the spoken claim, and we want to dig into the experience behind that claim. Also, we, we look at this in a court of law when People are trying to establish, for example, a judge is trying to establish somebody's innocence or guilt. They look for evidence as well. For kids, it's the idea of an investigator, right? That's looking for clues to solve a mystery. Do you like mystery, Brian? Yeah. So you look, you see how investigators look for clues to solve a mystery. Or a judge that's hearing evidence to pass a verdict. Now, we can also see in our lives and look for clues, evidence, or signs of true faith in Christ. So that's what we want to connect this introduction with. What about our faith? Is there a way to test the authenticity of our faith and confirm its reality? The Bible makes a case for that. What does the Spirit-filled life have to do with the test and confirmation of our faith? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray now for your guidance and leading. As we have introduced this topic, 
We pray that by the revelation of your word, by the power of your spirit, we may today understand what it means to have a genuine true faith and how that genuine true faith manifests itself in evidences, in signs, in demonstrations of its authenticity. Help us today. We ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. We have seen in Ephesians chapter 5, we go back quickly to verse 5. Verse 5 is the first uh, verse that we're going to read this morning. Again, we haven't said the main idea yet for those that are waiting for it. Uh, but in verse 5, the Apostle Paul says, For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. We move on, read on, and it goes on to say, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Verse 8, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things are exposed, that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. The Apostle Paul calls attention in this passage as we read on to our walk. And he is telling the Ephesians, he's telling believers, you ought to walk as children of light. Your walk must confirm, must be the evidence that you are children of light. Behave, live as what you are. You are children of light, or as he said at the beginning of the chapter, you are beloved children of God. He, Paul, specifically warns believers in verse 5 that those who practice unrighteousness have no inheritance in Christ's kingdom. Paul is here describing the lives of those sinners who lack any grief, conviction, and repentance about their sin. Their lifestyle is one of a willful, constant pattern of sinful disobedience. The Apostle Paul says that those who live like this do not have an inheritance with Christ and in his kingdom. So we want to make the argument based on Paul's assertion the main idea of the message this morning is that the Spirit-filled life manifests itself by the fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit-filled life manifests itself by the fruit of the Spirit. What does that mean? The way believers walk. The fruit of the Spirit will affect the way you walk. The way believers walk in good works by the fruit of the Spirit and this is the evidence and confirmation of our faith. Let me read the main idea again so that children can latch on to that. The Spirit-filled life manifests itself by the fruit of the Spirit. They're supposed to fill in the blanks there. The way believers walk in good works by the fruit of the Spirit, evidence and confirmation of the authenticity of their faith. Notice that we're not saying, and there's something that we want you to understand that we're not saying, is that we are saved by works. That is not what we are saying. 
We are not saying that somehow we are justified by our works or that our works are part of what God takes into account to justify us. The Bible has established and makes clear that we're justified only by faith in Christ Jesus. Now, the argument that the Bible makes and that we're going to see being made by Paul and other apostles is that whoever has true, genuine faith, this will be demonstrated in the works of the fruit of the Spirit that the fruit of the Spirit in the life of the believer will be shown in good works. And those good works testify. Those good works witness to. It is a confirmation of the validity and the genuineness of our faith. So the Apostle Paul in verse 5 brings a warning. And the warning is those who are fornicators, who engaged in a life of uncleanness, covetousness, idolaters, these who are willfully have a constant pattern of disobedience. And we have said in this first point, these are the people that lack any type of grief or sin. Why, how can somebody engage in an uninterrupted life of fornication and uncleanness? and covetousness, and idolatry. How can somebody uninterruptedly pursue those things? It is only because they lack grief over sin. He who grieves over sin can fall into this, these sins and any sin. We're not saying that we're perfect. We're not saying that once you become a Christian, now you no longer sin. No. Christians are liable to fall and to sin just like anybody else. But what we're saying and what we believe the Apostle Paul to be saying here is that a Christian's life is not characterized by a lack of grief over their sin. By a life that can, without any type of conviction or compulsion, engage in a sinful lifestyle and in the practice of a sinful lifestyle without grief in their hearts, without conviction in their hearts, and without, at some point, repentance in their hearts. So the Apostle Paul is describing here those that don't have such things, that are bereft of faith, that have, may have a profession of faith, may have a physical presence even in the body of Christ, but if their lives are characterized by such things, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. And they will not inherit the kingdom of God because they are not regenerated. They are not children of light. They are not um, sinners who have come to Christ by faith. So, once again, the Apostle Paul wants to help us understand that the Christian life is one that by faith, as beloved children of God, we walk in good works. Those good works issue from the fruit of the Holy Spirit and are evidence and confirmation that we are in Christ Jesus. That's what Paul has said in Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, the Apostle Paul says, For we are his workmanship. If we are a new creation in Christ, God says, you are my workmanship. By the way, the Greek word for workmanship is the Greek word from which we get the English word poem. We are his poema. We are his poem. That's what Paul is saying here. We are his poem. It's very much as an, as an artist has created a work of art and has put into that work of art his mind, right? His literary genius, his beauty, his conception of what is aesthetic and beautiful. Well, God has created us as his workmanship. We are his poem. 
And being his poem, we testify to this God. And how does that happen? It happens by our words, obviously, but it also happens by our good works in Christ Jesus. So he goes on to say in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, For we are his workmanship, his poem, created in Christ Jesus for good works. You see that? We have been created in Christ Jesus for good works. What is the purpose for which we were created? To glorify God, obviously, at the end of the day, is to bring glory to God as his poem. But that happens through our walk in good works works, our walk of obedience in Christ, or we could put it in other terms, our walk of love. After all, good works have to do with the law of God, the commandments of God. And the commandments of God, Christ summed up in the law of love. So we could substitute here and say that Christ Jesus, he, we were created in God, in Christ Jesus, for good works. Which is the same thing as to say for love. For the obedience of love. When we talk about good works, sometimes we, we, we usually, sometimes we, we respond, uh, some people do, beginning to bring the charge of legalism or Oh, now you're not talking about grace because you're talking about works. Not so. Not so. Grace and good works go together. We were created a new creature by faith in Christ Jesus for good works. Why? Why is that? Because the purpose of God is to bring us back into a relationship of love with Him. This is how I want you to think about good works. Good works is how we love God. God and love our neighbor. The first commandments, the first four commandments have to do with our love of God. And then the, the rest of the six commandments have to do with our love or na of neighbor. So God created us for love. What does that mean? He created us to love him and he created us to love our neighbor. We love our neighbor because we love God in obedience to God. It is because we love God that we love our neighbor. And we have been saved by faith alone so that we can love God again. Our problem was that we, when we turn our backs on God, when sin came into our lives, we then were filled with hatred toward God and hatred toward neighbor. We became at war with God and at war with our neighbor. So that's the condition from which we need to be saved. We need to be saved from our failure to love God with all our hearts, mind, and strength and our failure to love our neighbor. How do we get saved out of that condition? of failure, of falling short of the glory of God, which is loving him and loving his, the rest of his creatures, especially our neighbors. We're saved by faith, not by works. By faith, when we look at the love that God has shown for us at the cross, when we look at the love that God has demonstrated on the cross of Calvary, we see the gospel, the good news that I was, I am a sinner, the good news that I failed to love God and to love my neighbor. I deserve death, but yet Christ has loved me such that even though I was in that condition of ruin and misery before, a holy God that calls me to love him and to love neighbor. By the way, that's why we're punished. That's why hell comes to the life of a sinner. Because we don't want to love God and love neighbor. That's why. Because God, the God of love, calls us to love Him as the greatest treasure, as the most precious being. And we turn our backs and pursue idols. And in doing that, we become estranged not only from God, but also from our neighbors. And that is idolatry and covetousness. 
And as a result of that, all kinds of uncleanness comes into our hearts, into our lives. One of them is what Paul mentions, fornication. So Paul, God wants to save us from that. He wants to save us from the utter helplessness to love God and to love neighbor. That's what we are being saved from. That's our sin. Our sin is that we have failed to obey God in love. Obedience to God is, is true obedience to God is offered to Him as our loving worship of Him. God wants to save us from that. And He saves us from that. Obviously, He can save us by works because that is our, our very problem. Our very problem is that we cannot work ourselves back to God. What does that mean? We cannot love God, make it back to Him in love. We cannot restore our relationship of peace with God and then peace with neighbor and loving Him from the heart for the sake of God and His Son Christ. That's the problem with mankind. That's why then we are saved by faith. Faith is not works. Faith is not love. We must make a distinction between faith and love. Faith is that hand, empty hand, that comes before God and says, I am empty. I recognize that I am a sinner. I recognize that I don't love you, God, as I should. My love is all mixed up with all kinds of idols. I recognize that I've fallen short of giving you true worship. I recognize that I have been a hater of my neighbor. Yes, I may say to people that I love them. I may even say that I'm a good person. But at heart, I have had envy and jealousy and strive for neighbors in my life. Neighbor is anybody that's around you in your daily life. As a result of that, I recognize, oh God, that I stand justly condemned by you. And unless I repent of that, unless I repent of my utter failure to love you as you demand and to love my neighbor as you demand, I'm going to be separated from you for eternity. That's disobedience to the law of God. That's why, it, that's why people will spend an eternity away from God because they want to abide in their rebellion against God. They want to abide in their condition of not acknowledging God in Christ Jesus and as a result of that now loving their neighbor. So how are we saved out of that predicament? By faith. And faith is that empty hand that now sees that God in Christ Jesus has made a way for sinners such as we are. That God in Christ Jesus lived the perfect life of love that you and I could never have lived. That God in Christ Jesus fulfills the demands of love that the law called for. The demands of obedience, the demand for a perfect relationship with God from the heart and with neighbor. Who did that? Christ Jesus. That's the gospel. He lived a perfect life before God. He was faithful to the end in obedience under the law of God. And not only that, now, see, did Christ deserve to die? He didn't deserve to die. He was the Holy One. He was a perfect one. He was the one that loved God truly, perfectly, and neighbor as himself. He was a perfect one. So then notice that Christ becomes a substitute. He did that to provide before God's justice or before God's demand of love, the love that you and I could not bring and summon from our hearts. And he does that, and ultimately he pays the ultimate sacrifice because God demanded two things, that we loved him and we loved, loved neighbor. That was the obedience of the law. But then God said, if you break my commandments, if, in other words, if you don't love me, if you fail to love me, if you fail to love your neighbor, if you fail and break any one of my little commandments, 
because I am a holy and just God, I must bring about punishment. And the punishment is death. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, separation from God. And that's why Jesus dies. He dies for sinners. He dies as a substitute for those that could not save themselves, that could not bring themselves to love back, to love God with all their hearts, mind, and soul, that could not bring themselves in to love neighbor fully and perfectly without their self-centeredness. You see, follow that? You follow the implications of that? That's why Christ died to save us and bring us into that relationship that he had perfectly with the Father and he brings us into that relationship, restores us by his work, by his obedience, so that all we have to do to be saved, to be reconciled with God, to be restored with God, is look to him, acknowledging our sins, confessing it before the Father, and saying, save me, I need you. I do want to be restored to an eternal life, a relationship with you, and I know that you have made a way for me to be restored by faith. I trust you. I commit my life to you. I can't save myself. I'll never be good enough. But all I bring before you now is my sin, knowing that by faith in your Son, you cover me with forgiveness. You accept me because of the sacrifice of Christ on behalf of sinners. That is salvation by grace, Salvation only in Christ, in Christ alone, and by faith alone. That's how we are saved. And we should understand that, and we have made a lot of emphasis on that, but this is the other side of the coin that we're bringing today and that we want to make emphasis on. We have been saved for a relationship of love with God. And there is where our good works come into the equation. Those good works now are the evidence that we have been saved, that we have been reconciled with God. They're not perfect, as we're going to see. We continue to fail many times. We never reach the mark. But there has begun in the life of a Christian a process that is called sanctification. And that process of sanctification is where God takes a sinner that hated him and that was at war with neighbor, and now puts in his heart by faith, by looking at the love and work of Christ for us, and now pours into our hearts love for him. Love for him. That is the process of sanctification. The process of sanctification is... If we only look to the outward works of maybe going to church and going to Bible study or being baptized or taking a meal to the homeless or helping my... If we only look to that, we miss the larger point. Because the larger point is that we do all that because now we love God. And we love our neighbor. So these good works now are flowing from a heart in which God's love has been poured out by faith. That is sanctification, to grow then, to grow then in that process by which we walk in love for God, for Christ, and for our neighbor. And that manifests itself in good works. And that is all accomplished by faith as we continue to look to Christ, not to our works, as we continue to look to Christ as the grounds and the assurance and the basis for our justification, when we do that and continue to do that, then the result is a life that walks in love. A life whose walk of love manifests itself in good works because we love God. Isn't that what Jesus said? When you did it to the least of these, why? Did they do it to the least of these? You did it unto me. You were doing it unto me. You did it to them because you loved me. And you loved them because of the love for them that I put in your hearts for your neighbor. Let's take a look at some texts this morning. <clears throat> Let's begin by going to 
1 uh, Corinthians. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going cont- to continue to hear this idea that we read in Ephesians 5. 1 Corinthians 6. Notice what it, sexy in ver- what it says here in verses 9 through 10. 1 Corinthians 6, beginning in verse 9, it says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? The same idea. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Then he goes on to say, Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. This list is not exhaustive, okay? It is not a complete list. It is basically a compendium, an example of the many different works of unrighteousness that flow from the heart of unregenerate men. Okay? These are sins that characterize the practice of those that are not in Christ. These are sins that Christians can fall into. These are sins that Christians can fall into, but Christians cannot fall into these sins without grief in their hearts, without conviction that they are doing wrong, and without at some point repenting turning from them and struggling and wrestling against such sins because now they love God and they see themselves as children of light. So who are these that shall not inherit? Who are these unrighteous? Those that are completely abandoned to such lifestyle because there's no life of God in them. There's no genuine faith by which they have seen Christ as their Savior as their greatest treasure and precious Lord who saved them, who has shown them unconditional love. And as a result of that, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts to respond in love. And as a result of that, because we see our identification with Christ as His children, we grieve when God grieves. We are convicted when the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin and we turn from sin because the Holy Spirit lives in our lives. But those, then it says that, here it says the unrighteous. Those are characterized by unrighteousness. By the way, unrighteousness is disobedience to the commands of God. It's a willful, constant pattern of disobedience to the command of God, as we have said, without grief, without conviction, without repentance. Let me show you another verse. Let's go to 1 John. And it says clearly that they will not inherit the kingdom of Christ. 1 John chapter 6. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse 6. 1 John 3, beginning verse 6, it says, Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Now, when it says whoever abides in him does not sin, it's a reference to the habitual practice of sin. It is, it is, a, uh, it is put in that tense, in that present continuous tense to refer to the idea that those that abide in Christ do not live in sin and it doesn't bother them. And they never do anything about it. That's what John is saying. It says, those, uh, 1 John 3 verse 6, whoever abides in him, in other words, whoever lives with him, whoever is with him, whoever remains with him, does not practice sin. That's the idea. Does not habitually, uninterruptedly, unconcerned, without grief, without conviction, without repentance, live in sin. 
That's the idea. It is not the idea, of some have said, of sinless perfection. That if we're Christians, we will not ever sin. As some have concluded. We believe that's a mistake. We believe that is an error. The Bible does teach that Christians still sin. We are affected by sin as long as we are in this flesh and in this world. What Christians now don't have is the practice of sin. We now do not practice unrighteousness because now by faith we have begun to love God. And as a result of by faith loving God, we grieve what God grieves. We're convicted about the convictings of the Holy Spirit. And we repent and we are wrestling and trying to put away sin from our lives. Why? Because it hinders our fellowship and our experience of fellowship with God. So the Christian is putting off sin constantly because sin is always present. The Christian is always wrestling against it through grieving, conviction, confession, and repentance. Hence, the Bible describes a Christian as one who does not practice sin. Before we came to Christ, our shop was open for business. Open for sin. That's all we do. That's all we know to do. That's all we delight in. That's all we care about. We are hard sinners, hardcore. The more the better. Open for business. When the Holy Spirit comes into our lives by faith and unites us to Christ, He closes the shop. Obviously, in our flesh, there's still the propensity to sin, and we still do sin, but now, because somebody who is God by the Holy Spirit lives in me, I can no longer live a life in which I am open for business in the way that I was before. Now, when I see sin in my life, I see it as a deplorable condition. I see it as something that must be wrestled with. I see it as something that brings me sadness. I see it as something that hinders my delight. What I am open for business now is the delight of my relationship with God. What I now want to pursue and want more of is that Christ would dwell more in me. And that I would have a closer walk and intimacy and relationship with Him by faith. Hence, when I see sin in my shop, I grieve. It saddens me. It convicts me. And now, by the Spirit of God, by looking to Christ, it moves me to dependence on Christ and repentance. So this is what John is saying. Are we following that? We're not talking about sinless perfection, but we're talking about he who now is wrestling against that sin. Notice what John says. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins, whoever practices sin, has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Let no one deceive you. It's the same thing that Paul is saying in Ephesians 5. Let no one deceive you because for these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. John says, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous. What does it mean to practice righteousness? To obey God's commands. What does it mean to obey God's commands? To love God and to love our neighbor. He who practices righteousness Loving God and loving our neighbor is righteous because the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts. We don't want to practice the hatred of God. <laughs> we don't want to any longer practice rebellion against God. In a child of God, rebellion and sin, which we often sometimes still see, grieves our hearts, makes us miserable. Because what we want is the practice and the life of practicing the love of God. A bond of fellowship with God. A bond of growing in Christ-likeness 
and being drawn more and more to the image of Christ because communion with God is Christ-likeness. Remember that? Remember we said a while back that to feel close to God is dependent on our Christ-likeness. I don't feel close to God. I don't feel, well, insofar as you grow into the image of Christ, insofar as you do the will of God, you're going to feel close to God. And we do this by faith because we see Christ for us and seeing him for us, then we move on to, folks, the Bible says that faith worketh, worketh by love. Faith expresses itself in love. Our confession says that faith is accompanied by the graces and the virtues of the Holy Spirit. Even though we are saved by faith alone, we have a faith that is not alone. And that is part of our doctrine. That's part of what the Bible teaches. Martin Luther used to say that he who said that we're saved by faith alone and brought that to the fore then said that our faith is a busy thing, that our faith is always working. We're always concerned and busy with what? What does faith concern itself with? With the purpose of faith. What were we saved for? We read in Ephesians 2 a that we're God's poem for what? For good works. Works that he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So faith is never given for the sake of faith itself. Faith is given so that we would be busy. Busy about what? About the only thing, about the greatest thing that somebody could be engaged in. And what is that? The love of God. Faith is busy loving God. And as a result of that loving God, neighbor. So John says, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil. These are strong words. When was the last time you read this in 1 John? Do you have it blocked? Do you just skip over it when you <laughs> go to it? I bet you some folks just read over it. Just don't look at that, right? But we must look at it. We must be confronted by this word. If we want to be submitted to the word of God, we must let this word speak truth unto us. And it says what it says. He who sins is of the devil. He who practices unrighteousness is of the devil, has not been born again. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Why are we God's poem? What is God doing in our lives? He's destroying the works of the devil in our flesh. What did he save us for? He has not saved us for an empty faith. An empty faith is a contradiction in terms. There's no such thing as an empty faith. Whenever you have faith, then you have the destruction of the works of the devil. The ongoing demolition project of God destroying the works of the devil in my life. And that's why the Bible says that he whom God loves, he disciplines. He's, oh, he loves you just as you are in Christ Jesus. But he loves you so much that he saved you not to leave you as you are. He wants to demolish that habit of pornography. He wants to demolish that fornication. He wants to demolish that adultery. He wants to demolish your love of money. He's going to start going busting idols in your heart. He's going to, by the power of the Spirit, discipline you. If you're a child of God in such a way that you're going to be uncomfortable with your idols because now you love God by faith. And now you practice not on righteousness, but righteousness. Now you practice the love of God. And the love of God then comes into conflict with the love of the flesh and the love of the world and the love of the desires of the flesh. And now you have begun to experience a greater delight. A delight in the spirit. You have been given new appetites. 
This is not that God says, oh, I'm going to take away all these desires in which you now glory. And you're going to be somebody that's not going to have any contentment and joy and pleasure. Hear me out. The pleasures are found in a life of obedience with God. The pleasures of your soul are found in a walk of intimacy with God in Christ. The joy of your soul, in, in, if you're a child of God, will be found in a life of further abounding in the fruit of the Spirit and coming to know more and more intimacy with Christ. And that will begin to shape your lives in so many different ways. And will begin to change your ways in so many different ways as you have come to find another delight, another joy, another purpose in your life because of your relationship with God in Christ Jesus. So verse 9, so, he, so we have just read that the Son of God appeared to destroy the works of the devil. That's what we have been saved for. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. For his seed, notice that, his seed remains in him. It's the idea of a root. It's the idea that we have been planted with Christ. We have been rooted. There's a seed. Before, we didn't have any seed of God in me. There was no life of God in me. But now the seed of God is in us if we have been born again. And then it says, Whoever has been born of God does not sin, does not practice sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Verse 10, in this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Here it is again. In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Their, they, their nature comes to light. How does the children of light and the children of darkness, how do their natures come to light? How is it manifested? How is it shown? Right here, John says, whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. And now John begins to break it down to break it down into the practicality of what this theological term means, practice righteousness. What does that mean? It means, as we have just said and explained, to love God and to love our neighbor. Whoever does not practice loving God in Christ, whoever does not love Christ is not of God. Can you picture somebody that will go to heaven without the love of Christ? Can you ever envision somebody that says, I have faith, I'm going to heaven, but my problem is that I don't love Christ. <laughs> That's a contradiction. There cannot be somebody that claims to have faith that has not begun to experience and to have love for Christ. And we're not talking about perfection. That's, by the way, the process of sanctification where we are perfected slowly, gradually, and it never ends in this life. It never ends. One day we'll be perfected when Jesus Christ returns and we will stand fully and perfect in Christ. How? Loving Him fully. That's the purpose. But this purpose for which we have been saved has begun now. By the power of the Spirit, He has begun to have us increase in a life of love and the practice of love for Christ and as a result for our neighbor. I ask you this morning in closing, how do I relate to sin in my life presently? Think about it. How do you relate to sin? Is sin just the normal state of affairs? Is it business as usual in your life? Are you, not grieved? Are you not grieved by sin? Are you not pained when you see sin in your life? There's no grief at all whatsoever. Oh, no, it's okay. I have, I'm sinning, but I have Christ. 
By no means, Paul says in Romans chapter 6, by no means shall we sin that grace may abound. Some people seem to be getting that idea that this is the path of grace. The path of grace is that I continue to sin and, and that's okay. Well, if you continue to sin and that's okay, you are manifested as a children of darkness. That's what the Bible says. It's not that you are saved by your works. It's that your works then at the end of the day will manifest what's in your heart. Will manifest the quality of whether or not there is a new seed abiding in you of Christ. How do you relate to sin in your present life? Let me ask you, is there a confession in your, in your life? Is there daily confession in your life about your sins? If you never confess your sins to God, if you never speak with God about the truth of what God says about you and what's happening in your life, can you say that there is life, spiritual life in you? I ask you, is there a confession in your life? And, and lastly, is there repentance? I ask you, have you begun to see God's sin demolishing work begun in your life? Have you begun to see it? Have you begun to see God demolish pride in your life? Have you begun to see God demolish self-sufficiency in your life? Is he with the hammer of his grace is he with the scissor of the surgeon that loves you? Have you begun to see him prune you and begin to cut those things in your life that are not becoming of him? Have you begun to wrestle with sin, with sin by the power of the Holy Spirit? And have you begun to see yourself being adorned by the power of the Spirit in good works? Does it grieve and break your heart, a life of sin? Does it steal your peace and communion with God? I ask you. Does sin steal your peace and communion with God? Or are you just as peaceful and as restful when you're sinning as when you're not sinning in the sense as when you are confessed before God, as when you are seeking to do His will and wrestling against your sin? Is it okay? Do you feel restful and at peace in your sin? Or do you desire to obey God and find delight and peace? Find delight and peace when you do it. Do you find delight and peace when you obey God? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message. From your word, as we are confronted about our stand in Christ Jesus by faith manifested in the pursuit of good works in love. Father God, help us that we may not despair as we look to Christ to see Him as our treasure. That we look to Him and see Him precious and worthy of all our service and love that we may look to him and see that now, even when we were dead in sins and trespasses, you reconciled us to the Father, not by our works, but by faith, by grace alone, by the work of Christ alone. Father, if we do see that, I pray that today we may also experience in our lives that we love you, that we want to serve you, that we want to obey you. Father, we confess that we're powerless to do it in our own strength. But Father, we cry out to you and pray that you, Lord, may work in us in such a way to will and to do so that we may work out our salvation by the fruit of the Spirit in the good works that you have prepared from old for us to walk in. Father, we pray that our walk may evidence the reality of our faith. We pray humbly. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen and amen. We're going to invite the Spanish family to join us.
We're going to have our Lord's Supper this morning. So we invite you to stay uh, for the Lord's Supper this morning. It's an important part of our service to the Lord in which our faith is also strengthened to a walk, a further walk of service and love to Him. In a couple of minutes, we'll resume with our Spanish family. Esperamos a la familia en español que va a continuar. Va ahora a estar entrando para unirnos en la Santa Cena. de Jocabet Hermanos, en el nombre del Señor queremos comenzar nuestro servicio de adoración en esta mañana lo vamos a hacer con la celebración de la Santa Cena. We're going to begin, begin our worship service this morning as we do every first Sunday of the month with the celebration of the Lord's Supper. But we're going to sing a song that we have prepared. Vamos a cantar una canción mientras esperamos al resto. We'll sing a song while we wait for the rest to arrive. Above all powers, above all kings, above all natures and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man. Yeah. 
Vamos a leer en 1 Corintios 11, comenzando en el 23. We're going to be reading in 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 23. Porque yo recibí del Señor lo que también os he enseñado. Que el Señor Jesús, la noche que fue entregado, tomó pan y habiendo dado gracias, lo partió y dijo, Tomad, comed. Esto es mi cuerpo que por vosotros es partido. Hacer esto en memoria de mí. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Asimismo, tomó también la copa. Después de haber cenado diciendo, esta copa es el nuevo pacto en mi sangre. Hacer esto todas las veces que la bebiereis en memoria de mí. Así pues, todas las veces que comieres este pan y bebiereis esta copa, la muerte del Señor anunciáis hasta que Él venga. In the same manner, He also took the cup. After supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Venimos hoy a la Santa Cena del Señor. We have come today to the Lord's Supper, and we have said time and time again that the Lord's Supper is given to us for strengthening of our faith. And our walk in Christ. La Santa Cena nos es dada para fortalecer nuestra fe y nuestro caminar en Cristo. Es en la Santa Cena donde a nosotros se nos presenta de una manera muy clara por qué vivimos, por qué tenemos vida eterna y relación con Dios. It is in the Lord's Supper that we are presented in a very clear and unequivocal way why we live. Why we have a relationship with God. Tenemos, la iglesia tiene el mensaje predicado y el mensaje recordado o visible a través de la Santa Cena. We can hear the word of God and we can also see in this act of the Lord's Supper visually be reminded of why we live. ¿Por qué vivimos? Vivimos no por nuestras obras, sino por la obra de Cristo. Why are we alive? Why do we have eternal life? Not because of our works, but because of the work of Christ alone. Vivimos por la obra de Cristo solamente en nuestras vidas. Y por eso es que el Señor nos ha dejado esta, esta cena para recordarnos en este, en este símbolo, en este sacramento, en este aparente misterio de la fe, cómo es que un pecador puede...